Hey, uh, hi everyone. We are uh, good. We're going to look at Acts tonight, which is where we're studying. Before we do that, I saw something floating around on the internet today, and I'd like, oh, that's so perfect. I have to show people this. I don't know if you're going to be able to read this or not, um, but basically talking about the last two and a half months, three months of kind of what the church has walked through uh, to give you a picture of this. So I saw this on the internet and I was like, this is so perfect. Uh, and isn't that awesome? Just nothing. We've been doing nothing. No, I'm just kidding. There's something else up there. Here, here we go. Right. So I saw this. Maybe you saw this today. So it's, it says this, church member number one, pastor, why in the world are you reopening the church services so soon, right? That's the, there's half the people who are saying that. Uh, per, church member number two, pastor, why in the world did you ever shut churches services down in the first place? That's ungodly, right? That's not biblical. Why would you shut it down? So I just want you to know, over the last two, uh, three and a half, three months or so, this has been the constant voice, right? This same thing. Here we go. Church member number one, pastor, you don't seem to care about the struggle of minorities, right? That was a huge one probably still today, two weeks ago, you don't care about minorities, or, or, or that was one of the voices. Church member number two, pastor, you haven't, you haven't been supportive enough of the police. Both those voices two weeks ago, very loud, very passionate, very clear. Church member number one, down at the bottom, require masks, pastor, clearly you don't care about human lives. You have to wear a mask when you come to church. That's been one voice. Church member number two, require masks, Pastor, clearly you don't care about human liberty, right? That's been the other side. Now, I, I imagine amongst y'all, there's probably voices on both sides. Uh, we did a church survey uh, probably a week ago, still kind of ongoing right now. I kid you not, they are right down the middle. Like people who are on one side passionately, we will not come back to church until people are, everyone's wearing a mask. On the other side, it's an agenda. It's a political agenda. You can't make where people wear masks. They're not healthy for you. Science proves it. Other side, science proves masks work. So I just want you to know, over the last couple of months, this is where we've been at as a church. Closing off with the end there, it says, Lord, are you sure you don't want me to sell cars for a living? <laughs> every pastor in America right now. And I will just tell you, it is every church. As, as all the pastors that I know as I've talked to them, they're like, yeah, Jeff, like people were saying, like, why did you ever close down your doors? How could you? That sort of thing. Anthony, how you doing? Good to see you. It, it, it's been crazy. So here's, what I, here's why I even bring that up. Because I assume you have an opinion. Because everyone has an opinion. And let me just tell you, your opinion is right. It is. So right? You're, I mean, we all have opinions. We've formulated them through deep thought, scientific knowledge, and we've come to this conclusion. That's why we have our opinion. But I would just tell you this, and this, again, this is why I even bring this up. So important that you don't allow your opinion to stop loving, caring for your brother or sister in the Lord. Like, I, I, I'm seeing, like, very clear division within the church of like, this is what we believe. And, and on, even this morning, just as people come and they share their viewpoints on the mask or, or not the mask or, or the, you know, the new one this week, did you know that you knew the new one this week? Like the worship, you can't sing in church and, or you can sing in church and you can't take away that right. And people are like, well, I just want to be safe. I just want to be, so get it. So you can share your opinion. I would just say, don't let that cloud your relationship with your brother and sister in the Lord. Like, that would be the worst possible thing if a year from now, and, and let's just say in a year from now, uh, everyone's healthy and great, and churches divided everywhere because everybody decided they were going to choose their side, fight for it, and then not come to church. Um, that somebody would have the opinion, like, well, I'm going to stop going to church because of all this. And it's like, man, don't do that. I get it. Like, I get it. You, you're passionate. They're passionate. But I would just say don't allow the church to be divided over these issues, these things. And you can look for the root, but I'm just telling you, pastors, we're having conversations over these things week all week long, and I, and I think I was telling someone, and we even have different opinions over the way things should, should go on staff. And so I'm just telling you, stay in the fight, stay in the game. I think that what the word would say is, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, uh, fight for unity, uh, do it with love, do it with compassion, do it with tender heart, and and be humble about it. Those are the five things we see in Peter. Like those five things, if we could just continue to go back to those things, not saying you can't have opinion, not saying that your opinion is wrong. I'm just saying, don't let that pull the church apart. And here's where we'll dive into our message tonight. Uh, we're gonna be in Acts chapter four. Is Acts chapter four sound right? Acts chapter four. 
is where we're going to be. Acts chapter 4. And there's a blank screen for you to look at for a little bit. Um, here's what's so important about this. Um, there were some people who thought the church was pretty important, <laughs> right? That they were willing to die for the church. And so again, I, I bring up these points because these points are, are important. I'm not saying they're not, but when we talk about somebody who was willing to die for the church, man, I, I feel like we can get past some of these things to, to keep coming together, gathering together, worshiping the Lord together, studying his word together, being compassionate, loving, tenderhearted towards each other. Uh, I think we can do that. And so when we look at our text, we're looking at kind of like some of you guys, did you guys see Hamilton came out the other day on Disney Plus? How many of you guys have watched Hamilton so far? How many, do you guys go to see Hamilton? Anybody? All right. Well, I'm just telling you, if you get a chance to watch it, it's pretty powerful. Um, founding father type stuff. This is like founding father church type stuff we're going to look at today. Guys who were like in the, in the thick of it and got in a lot of trouble uh, for the church. And so we'll look at that in, in Acts chapter 4. Before we do that, turn to Acts chapter 3 because I want you to kind of see what the setting of this text is. Acts chapter 3, uh, verse 6 and if you remember correctly from last week, uh, Peter and John, they've gone to go pray in the temple. And there's a guy there. You remember this guy? You guys were here last week, yeah? He, there was a guy who, was, who, was, uh, who couldn't walk from birth. His, his legs didn't work or his ankles didn't work. Something didn't work to where they would carry him every day uh, to the temple gates and he would, he would beg just to get, to get by. And so then we get to Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Look what it says. He looks up and he, and he says, you know, do you have something to give me? And, and Peter responds with this comment. Maybe you've heard it before. Silver and gold I do not have, but that I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Rise up and walk, he tells him. And he took up the right hand and left, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, so he that's the guy who was injured, leaping up, stood up and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Verse 11. Now as the lame man was healed, uh, was, was healed, held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them to the porch, which is called Solomon's, uh, Solomon's porch, greatly amazed. Now they're in the temple, right? So that's where Peter and John had gone to go pray. They see this guy. He says, he, help me, like give me some, some, some money. They said, I got something better for you. Uh, and now we're in verse 12. So when Peter saw this crowd gathering because of what had just happened, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? And then Peter just, just preaches on them. Like, it was like, here's this moment I've got. I, the guy just got healed. I don't even know if Peter knew that was going to happen that day, right? He's just, they're just he, he and John are just going to pray like they normally would at the temple. God does something miraculous and now he's got this audience of people that have gathered around. Verse 19, repent therefore and be converted, he tells them, that your sins may be blotted out. Not that you would just live a better life, not that, that Jesus has got something for you and it's going to be great after this, but actually he just calls them out. He says that your sins may be taken care of so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom Heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And that's what Peter says to this crowd. It's almost like, I got this moment. <laughs> I got their attention. They're all looking at me. We just healed a guy. There's power here. And he could have done so many things with that moment. He could have started his own revolution. He could have started his own movement. But he goes right back to Jesus. And he's very clear. He's like, that your sins may be blotted out, that you may receive a time of re re uh, refreshing. And God is going to do a restoration. That's a huge theme here. God is restoring things. In the same way that he's restored this man's legs and his ability to walk, which he hadn't had his entire life, God is going to do some more restoration now right? That's what his, his whole purpose is, that God would forgive, God would refresh, and God would restore in this moment. Now, we move to the text that we are looking at tonight. So important you look at that context, because now look what happens in verse 4. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees 
came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Preached in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of them, men, came to be about 5,000. Now, I get this image of those guys coming after them. I get this image of the Imperial Guard and stormtroopers, right? That, that I hear the music, right? Dun, dun, da, da, dun, da, 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 right? Th- that, that this amazing thing has just happened. This guy has been healed. Jesus is being preached. And all of a sudden, Luke tells us, as he's writing this, the, capt- the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees, the religious dudes of the day, all come to stop whatever was going on. That, that they weren't going to have that happening in the temple. That you're not, you're not going to come into our house and start preaching. They're the, kind of the, the evil empire of the moment, right? So I get that picture, and, and they go and they get them, and, and it says that they laid hands on them. It wasn't like they were praying for them, by the way. It was like literally like, we're going to lay hands on you right now, right? And they, they pull them away to put them into custody. Here's the issue they had with them. Actually, there was two issues. If you look at the text, it says they taught the people. That was issue number one. Here are these simple men, right? Not priests. They're, they're, not, they're not Sadducees. And here they are in our temple. They're teaching. They're not rabbis. And who gave you the right to come into our temple and just teach? You can't do that. Well, I would just say it's one of the... the that was the next slide, but we can go back. I, that wasn't here. That wasn't there yet. We'll get there in a little bit, right? Uh, they, who, who gives you the right? Which is the beauty of, of, of really of, of the Christian faith, right? That it really is you filled with the Spirit, what God has done in your life, and you can preach it. Like you can go and share that with people. Peter could go, he'd been with Jesus, and he could share the things that Jesus had taught him and just as much as he could possibly share about what was going to happen in God's plan. He could share that. And that's the beauty. It's not, it doesn't take rank. It doesn't take collegiate uh, levels, right, to teach the gospel, to preach the gospel. In fact, one of the things that we've been looking at uh, in our study on, in Peter is that Peter says this thing where he says, go, go share the hope that's within you. Go, go share the hope that's within you. And I would make the argument he actually says, be ready in all seasons to share that hope that's within you. And I would make the argument, what he's not saying there, is that be able to know all the questions about the Bible before you share your faith. Or be able to express all the theological arguments before you share your faith. No, I think what he's saying there to those people, Peter, as he's writing, is be ready to share why you have hope in Jesus. Be, be ready to share why you believe in Jesus. Why, why do you come to church? Why do, you, why do you profess Christianity? I think that's what he's saying to the people at the time. And Peter can go out and say, guys, this guy was healed, but let me tell you what the hope I have in Christ is. I, I saw him do miracles. I, I saw him uh, do wonderful things, things that were just blow your mind. Peter would share that. Uh, he was my friend. We, we had heart-to-heart conversations Peter could share that. I I saw a resurrected guy, (laughs) a guy who I know died and then was resurrected. Peter could share that with the people in the temple courts that day. So in other words, they come down and they say, who gives you the right to teach here? And and Peter would only have to say, listen, I'm sharing the hope that I have in my friend and my Savior, Jesus Christ. The second issue they had, look what they had. What did they have an issue with? See that? The resurrection. They had an issue with the resurrection. How dare you come here? Number one, you're teaching. You, don't, you, don't, you can't be teaching here. Secondly, secondly, this whole resurrected Jesus thing, we put that to bed, right? That, that's a non-issue right now. We're not even talking about that. Don't come preach that resurrected Jesus thing here. We took care of Jesus. Do you see who's a part of this? The, the Sadducees. And all those that were there, a part of the the crucifixion of Jesus. And we're going to hear more names here in a second. We took care of that. Don't don't bring that back around here again. Like, we'll have to take care of you next, again, 
right? You can't come to the temple and preach Jesus and preach at all. What specifically did they say? Look at Acts 3.14. This is what, and if you were here last week, this is what they were preaching. Look at Acts 3.14. But you denied the Holy One, the just, is what, uh, what uh, Peter calls him. And asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And killed the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead. That was one of the things that Peter was preaching to the crowd that had gathered that day. He says this too. To you in verse 26, uh, Acts 3, verse 26. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities or from your sin. He had just got done preaching at least two in instances where he talked about resurrection and God raising Jesus from the dead, raising his servant. And they heard that, and they're like, no, uh-uh. Those are two things you cannot do. You can't teach here, and you can't teach the resurrection of the dead. But they preached. They went against the authority of the day, their authority, the ones that they had been underneath for so long, and they preached, and they preached, and they preached. And the question you would say was, was it worth it? Was it worth it to go against the tide? And, and I would just say, it's like one of those things that, I don't know if you've, uh, I, I kind of look at Apple products like this. Apple products are so expensive, right? So costly. If you have a MacBook or you have any type of Apple product, you're like, this is so expensive. Like I could get a cheaper PC somewhere else. I could get that thing cheaper if it wasn't Apple. But the thing I've found time and time with Apple, and if you're a PC person, you're gonna be like, boo, right? Is that it just lasts. It just, I mean, I've got, I have a computer for like the last eight years and it's never had one issue. I've never had to take it in or I've, I've never had to go like get it debugged or I don't even people, do people still debug computers now? Oh, they do, okay. I've never had it because it's just been like, it's been great. And, 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 and so it's like the expensive thing, but the question is, you ask me, is it worth it? absolutely worth it because I don't have issue with it. I don't have to worry about it. So I'd buy it again. So the question here is, is what's about ready to happen to them worth it? Was it worth taking that bold step and all those people gathering around and, and, and getting in trouble by the religious authorities of the day? I got to say yes, because verse four says, however, even though they got their hands laid on them, right? Even though they got taken into custody, look at verse four. Many of those who heard the word believed and the number of them, the men, came to about 5,000. 5,000. 5,000 souls changed because these two men decided, hey, we've got this opportunity. Like, God just did something miraculous. These people are gathering. We can't stop them. And we're going to preach. And we're going to get in trouble. We, I mean, they know. We're in the temple. We're preaching resurrection. We're not supposed to be teaching. And here, we, we just came for prayer. We're going to go along with the daily routine. And we had to break out of it because there was this moment where these people were listening and that we know what's going to happen. And I think if you went back and you asked them, Peter, John, was it worth it? They would say, Jeff, 5,000 souls changed eternally. They believed in the resurrection of Christ. So absolutely, it was worth it. So they spend the night in jail right? And the next day, they have a trial in front of the higher-ups, and that was the picture that I was going to show you next. I, I, I get it. These guys are all good guys, right? They're, they're not bad guys. But I figured there's two guys, like Peter and John, like right there. It's perfect. They're in robes, and they're surrounded by some religious Jedi guys, right? They're religious council people. So I figured, even though they're good, and these guys, te technically, they would be the bad guys, but I figured that picture would be good. So they're standing in front of this council. Let's read and see what happens Next, verse 5. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, so those are the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as, now these are familiar names because we see them in, in Jesus' trial, as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or what name have you done this? Have you healed this guy? Some familiar names there. Peter, not at all freaked out by the night in jail, right? He's going to stand in front of these guys. I mean, I, I don't want to spend any time in jail. So that would freak me out. But Peter's not freaked out by this. 
I, I would just say the, the radical change in Peter's life. Think about it for a second. Peter's the one that denied Jesus how many times? Three times, right? Three times denies Jesus. Three times in front of people, just regular people, he denies him. And here in this moment, he's standing in front of this council, and they say, by what power? And you would think, man, scared Peter doesn't do it, doesn't get scared. I think the resurrection changed his mind. Oftentimes, one of the things that people will point to when they say, well, how do you prove the resurrection is true? How do you prove that it's true? One of the proofs, there's like, there's seven or eight that people use a lot, but one of them is the transformation of Peter. Uh, another one is of Jesus' brother, uh, James, right? Huge transformation. But Peter is one of those transformation people that's like, wow, he went from denying Christ three times to standing in front of the council, standing in front of at least 5,000 people and preaching Jesus. There's a radical transformation in Peter. The coming of the Holy Spirit would be another one. Jesus had prepared them as well. I don't know if you remember this. Um, that I, I don't think I put it up there. Turn to Matthew real quick. Matthew, verse 19, uh, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Verse 16, there's a moment where Jesus is going to send out his guys, and I think what he's doing there, his disciples, I think what he's doing there is he's preparing them. It, it's like if you have a professor at, at school, and, and you're like, uh, we've got this hard test coming up, and he gives you or she gives you some test questions so you can start to study for them, so you can be ready for the big test. And Jesus did that with his guys in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Look what he says. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. This is, this is practice time before I leave and I'm crucified because when I leave, they're going to come after you. And, and this is one of those moments that we we'll read about in our text this, uh, tonight. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. Verse 17. You will be handed over, listen to what he says, over to local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. That, that moment is here, Right? On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. In other words, Jews and Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Whoever acknowledges me before others... I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whatever, whoever disowns me, I jumped to 32, whoever disowns me before others, I will disown them before my Father in heaven. So Peter comes before this council. Think about it. Peter comes before this council. And he would probably, even that night in jail, he's probably thinking, oh my gosh, tomorrow's a huge day. We're, we're up for trial. And I imagine they remember back to this moment of training that Jesus did with them. Oh, I remember what he said. I remember he said we're gonna, this moment would happen. We're, we're in deep trouble, John, <laughs> right? We're in deep trouble. Things could go really wrong tomorrow in front of these guys, these religious leaders, the, the high priest. I mean, come on, right? Things could go really wrong for us. But was it worth it? Absolutely. 5,000 people believed. All right, okay, we're going to go through this. And they're probably thinking about what are we going to say? What are we going to say? How are we going to defend ourselves? And, and he remembers back to Jesus' moment of like, Hey, when you stand before these councils, don't worry about what you're going to say. My Father's Spirit will instruct you on what to say. I, I would even think as he was talking to those 5,000 that had gathered after the healing, just moved by the Spirit to share and, and say, repent, turn away from your sins. God's doing a new thing. God is, God is restoring all things. Then he gets to this moment, and they're standing in front of this high priest in this moment. The question was, Remember what the question was? Somebody help me. What was the question? By what? By what name? By, by what name are you able to heal this man? Right? Could have gone soft. Totally could have gone soft. Uh, I don't know. It was luck. <laughs> right? It just, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say the name of Jesus, but he doesn't. Look what he says in verse 8. Right? Remember what he talked about. My, my Father's Spirit will fill you. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, what? filled with the Holy Spirit. What are we going to say? What are we going to say? Don't worry about what you're going to say. My Father's Spirit will fill you. Said to them, rulers of the people and the elders of Israel. Now this is bold Peter standing up. 
If we this day are judged for good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whoa, look out, Peter. It's coming after you, right? Talking to these guys who were at the trials of Jesus, who literally were part of his crucifixion, who said, listen, this guy needs to be getting rid, gotten rid of. Now Peter, standing before these guys who already took care of Jesus, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. How did you heal this guy? In the name of Jesus. Verse 11. This is the stone. Now he goes really deep in on him. <laughs> this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Then he says, nor is there salvation in any other. Let me read that again. Verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Remember the question, by which power do you do this? And he's filled with the Spirit. Luke says it right here in Acts. Filled with the Holy Spirit. He's like, this is the moment, right? I have Jesus' betrayers in front of me, the ones that convicted him. I've got this moment. And filled with the Spirit, I'm not going to waste it. I could be afraid. I could say, I don't know what name it was. Peter, John, I don't know. I get confused sometimes. No, no, I got it right here. Here it is, is the name of Jesus. And he doesn't just stop with that. He goes in on them with Psalm 118, verse 22. This is what Psalm 118, basically it's right there. It's the chief, it's the, the stone, the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected, that the people, the Jewish people rejected the, the chief cornerstone. The, the stone that God would build his, his house off of. In fact, I do have this for you. Take a look what Peter says. 1 Peter 2, 4. Coming to him as... Now, d just real quick before I read this. You got to see this, right? So Peter's talking, right? Peter's using Psalm 118, 22 in front of this council of people, right? That don't like him very much. And he's like, filled with the Spirit. I'm going to tell you who you just rejected, Right? Then, this is the same Peter who later writes in more depth about who the cornerstone is, right? So Peter, here in front of the council, and then Peter, later on, writing to churches that had been dispersed all over, here's what he says, kind of fills up, what is the cornerstone? What do you mean by that? Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected uh, by man, I believe is what it says, behold, I lay in, in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to, and the word there is shame. In other words, believe in Jesus, Peter writing that later on, will by, by no means put to shame. This chief cornerstone which you rejected, it's God's precious cornerstone. Look what he, he goes on to say. Therefore, to you who believe, this is still Peter writing to those churches, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected. Now he's pointing to the council now and he's basically saying, you are the builders, right? You are the ones who rejected the chief cornerstone. Has become a chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. That's from Isaiah 8.14 he's quoting. Basically, you guys rejected the God's promised one, his Messiah, his chief cornerstone, he to you became a stumbling stone. We can't get past this Jesus guy. You tripped over him. He was a rock of offense to you. The stumble, they, uh, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. What he's saying there to those guys, and he doesn't go soft on them, is you missed it. You missed it. God sent his Messiah. God sent the one he would come to restore all things. And you crucified him, right? That's what he's telling them. That's Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times. But in boldness, he comes out and he just preaches it, filled with the Spirit. Now he says one more thing, and here's where we're going to close tonight. And actually, uh, ironically, this coming Wednesday... Uh, I'm answering, uh, we, we're, throughout the summer, we do this thing called Resonance, which is out on the front parking lot. It's a band. Uh, it's, it's someone teaching, but it's just like taco truck. It's great. It's so much fun. Um, and it's evening, and so the sun's going down. It's really cool. Anyways, we've decided over the summer that we were going to hit some hot 
topic issues as far as like questions that everybody asks. So uh, last week was, can we really trust the Bible? That was one of the questions that we asked. Um, the first week was, is there God? Is, does God exist? What? What's our purpose, right? Of course it is, and that goes along with does God ex exist, I guess. Anyways, um, I got it all memorized up here in my head. Uh, no, this week is how could Christianity be the only way? How could Christianity be the only way? So I get like 25 minutes to answer that question. So that's this weekend, or this Wednesday, sorry, this Wednesday. So come join us for that. But look at the text, what he says here next, what, Jesus, uh, what Peter says next, talking to these guys. Look at verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. I will talk more about that on Wednesday. We're going to talk about it tonight. But look what he says. Uh, first of all, there's the idea of this idea of being saved. And he's talking to these people and he's saying, and, he, and the idea is you need to be restored. That you need to be saved from something. Jesus said it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through who? Through me, John 14, 6. I mean, so Jesus makes that claim. So that's, that's huge. The one that we follow makes the claims of being the only way. Now, just bear with me because we got this. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I'm not going to make every argument for why Christianity is the only way tonight. I just want to talk about this one passage. So turn with me to Romans chapter 5. And, and what is so interesting that he says here is that there has to be a salvation. There has to be being saved. There's no other name by which someone is saved. Because the question to them was, by what name did you heal this man? And, and, and then maybe another way you could say that is, by which way did you restore this man? He wasn't able to walk all his life. He's been restored, and now he's walking. And, and what, what Luke wants us to know and what Peter wants them to know is that there is a bigger restoration going on here. That's why he does the miracle. And that's what we saw Jesus do that all the time. He would do this miracle and people would be like, holy cow, like, what are you doing? Like, and then people would gather around. What would Jesus do? He would teach them, right? So he would use the signs and wonders to, to draw people in and then learn a bigger concept. Same thing here. There's this healing and a restoration goes on. Now, he's saying, listen, to the people in the council, you're amazed by this, but there's no other way to receive salvation but through the name of Jesus. Now, salvation from what? Now, I will grant it to you. This is a long text that we're about ready to read. That's why I have you turn there so that you can read it with us. But this, in this lies the answer to the question, why is Christianity the only way? How can Jesus be the only way, right? It seems arrogant. It seems narrow-minded, right? Look at what verse 12 says, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, and I, I'll grant, again, a long text, but stay with me through it. Therefore, just as though one man, just through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Why? Because all sin. So there's a sin problem. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. In other words, how would you know what sin was if the law was not there to say, that's sin, right? That's sin. So what, what uh, Romans is making the argument for is sin existed, but there was no rule. So no one knew like, hey, I'm, I'm sinning. I'm doing something that I shouldn't do. The law comes and says, that's sin. Oh, okay, right? 14. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam, the one who initiated sin, to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. In other words, Adam is a type in the same way that Adam brought sin. We're going to learn about somebody here in a second who eradicates sin, right? Who is the answer to sin. He's a type. He's, a, he's the kind of. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. Oh, there's a free gift here. For if by the one man's offense many died, that's Adam, much more the grace of God that, and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. There's a sin problem. Sin comes in. Sin brings death. 
right? That's the argument here. Law, hey, guess what? We have a sin problem. Law comes, you have a sin problem. Oh, okay, I see that, all right? Well, what are we going to do with it? How do I get rid of this problem? And he's saying, by God's grace, there is an answer, a free gift that comes. Now look at verse 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, Adam, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, death. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. In other words, through Jesus we are justified. For if by the one man's offensive offense death reigned through the one, Adam, which more those who received abundance, those who see the abundance of grace and, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, that's, that's through Adam, all men received the sin, the sin punishment, resulting in the condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, that is death on the cross, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, the offense might abound. In other words, we identify sin. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's the argument here. We regard, so the question then is, well, how is it that, that Peter can say and Luke can write, nor is there salvation in any other? For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be, and he says, saved. It's because they identify this idea that there's a sin problem starting all the way back at the garden in humanity. Adam's sin infiltrated every human being from then until now. Now there has to be a salvation from that. Now, that's where Christianity comes in. That's where Jesus comes in. He says, I will answer that sin problem. I will bring righteousness and justification to that sin problem. And it's only through the perfect sinless son of God dying on a cross that, that Christianity makes that claim to saying, hey, there is only one way. John 14, 6, Jesus says there is only one way. Here's why, because there's only one person that could take away the sin problem. So the question is, it seems arrogant. It seems cocky. It seems like brash. You're really going to tell me in this world where there's so many different belief systems and so many different things that Jesus is the only way. And I would say, listen, first of all, uh, Christians should not be arrogant about that, right? That is the last, when we talk about Christianity and, and who Christ is, it, it actually should be, uh, Christians should be humble above all things. So arrogant should not be the thing, right? Humble should be the thing. That, that is a, it's his grace that, that leads us to salvation. So grace before all things. But clear, because when we say, hey, I'm a Christian, what we're saying is not that we're, we're following a bunch of belief principles, right? But that we follow Jesus. And Jesus makes the claim that I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Not because he had a better religious system, but because he said, listen, I, I'm the only one who takes care of the sin problem, which we read goes all the way back to Adam. I'm the only one. So it's not an arrogant claim, it's a truth claim. And so then the question is, it's our heart and our attitude towards other people who believe different things that matters. So we, if we hold truth in Christ, then we can be humble. We don't have to be arrogant in that belief system. We just say, listen, Lord, use me in any way you see fit to reach people with this truth, which I live my life around which I hold to so tightly because of who Jesus is. And which these founding fathers, right? As we talk about the 4th of July, we talked about him a little bit. These founding fathers said, listen, I will stand in front of 5,000 people and preach that. I will stand in front of the councils and you'll see next week what happens to these two guys. Um, they spend a night in jail, but there's other things that happen to them uh, because of what they believed and what they kept professing in faith. And, and the question then comes for us is what, what, what extent will we go to to share that truth? right? What, what will we be willing to walk through to share that truth? And I would just suggest to you, um, especially in the culture we're in today, humility goes a long way, right? 
arrogance, pride, th- that, is, that will just cast you off immediately. So humility, holding on to the truth, and grace. You know, the grace is so important. Um, I think now's the time you guys break into groups. Do you come and explain that? We worship. Okay, let's do that right now. Let me pray, and then you come up and do that. All right. Sunday nights, you guys are awesome. This is such an a incredible group. I can't wait till one day where we're back in the cafe again, and there's people filled all the way to the back and again, and it's hard to, hey, you know. But, you know, it is what it is now. Keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, and God will get us back to that spot again, you know. Maybe some uh, good changes are happening too. So that's, that's been one of the cool things. I didn't bring that up before. There's a lot of good things happening in the church too uh, that we're seeing that's like building of our faith. So keep walking that. Lord, uh, we trust you. Uh, Lord, you've called us together to be the church. Um, I think one of the things I, I, you're impressing upon me is that even though everything feels so different when we walk through those doors, it doesn't seem like, sometimes it doesn't feel like church, so to speak. Uh, but you're teaching us something different, Lord. There's something different in this season. Um, the way, the, the importance of gathering together and just being people, and, and, and whether a building looks different or not, or where we sit looks different. Uh, but you're, you're teaching us to, to be a people. Um, Lord, I think one of those things that you're impressing upon me is, is, is our, our preaching of the gospel cannot change. Um, Lord, that, that we, don't, we don't move off of that value of, of, of what we do as a church in preaching the gospel, of sharing your, your truth. Um, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, I, I feel like one of the things you're, you're teaching us is unity matters. Uh, what we do with our heart and with our mouth and with our mind and what we say to people about people matters in this time. Lord, help us to be a church uh, that fights for unity. Um, Lord, no matter what, at all costs, help us to fight for that. God, would you continue to instruct us in this? Thanks for your, your word. Uh, thanks for the way it instructs our hearts. May we be moved this week to, to be open with who we are in you, to be strong in who we are with you, not arrogant, not prideful, not boastful, uh, humble, in fact. Uh, but Lord, help us to be strong in our faith and be ready to share that when you call us to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714 Eight nine one nine four nine five.